On behalf of the National Eczema Association, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar Wednesday presentation, The Truth About Eczema and Allergies. I'm your host, Danny Morsehead, Marketing and Communications Manager at the National Eczema Association. And our presenter today is Ari Zelig. Dr. Zelig is at Macaulay, at Macaulay Allergy and is an allergist and immunologist. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Ari Zelig. Thank you so much, Danny. And I want to thank the National Eczema Association for having me tonight. I'll go ahead and show my screen here. So from the beginning. Um, I'm an allergist immunologist, recently moved back to my hometown of uh, Memphis, Tennessee, joined a practice uh, called McCulley Allergy, and I have um, an office in Mississippi and Tennessee where I take care of patients with a wide uh, array of allergic and immunologic conditions. One of the diseases that I'm really passionate about is eczema, and that's what brings us all here tonight. So um, without further ado, tonight we're going to talk about the truth about eczema and allergies. And I'll be having a question and answer session after the PowerPoint and happy to, um, to answer any questions you may have in regards to eczema or um, any type of allergic condition that, uh, that we take care of. So the objectives for the evening, um, first of all, we're going to explore allergies role in eczema. We're gonna talk about eczema and ATP or atopic disorders. We're gonna discuss the relationship between eczema and food allergy, the relationship between eczema and environmental allergies, then talk about the next steps uh, if you suspect allergies may be affecting your eczema. And then lastly, we're going to discuss how to manage allergy-related triggers and flares. Next, we're going to get into some basics uh, of eczema and what A to B is. So eczema is also known as atopic dermatitis, or AD for short. Um, we know it's a chronic inflammatory skin disease that affects up to 15% of the U.S. population. The majority of patients with eczema do have a family history of A to B. And what A to B refers to basically is the genetic tendency to develop allergic diseases such as eczema, asthma, food allergy, allergic rhinitis, which is also known as hay fever. Um, and the A to B is associated with a heightened immune response to common inhaled environmental allergens as well as food allergens. So these heightened immune responses are what we call TH2 immune responses, and they produce a wide array of allergic and inflammatory mediators and chemicals. Um, the pathways that are involved in these immune responses are the targets of eczema therapies that we already have available, and they're also the targets of those that are in development. Um, some of these mediators and chemicals that are increased among patients with eczema and allergic diseases include elevations in IgE, which is the allergic antibody, and eosinophils, which are specific white blood cells that play a role in many allergic disorders. So when we talk about eczema, we often refer to it as the first step of the atopic march or the allergic march. And what that march refers to essentially is a typical progression of allergic diseases that often begins really early in life. Um, so often patients will start out with eczema and then go on to develop what we call other IgE mediated conditions or other allergic conditions such as food allergy, allergic rhinitis, hay fever, and asthma. So here's basically a little chart um, showing the atopic march. Um, in blue on the left, we see eczema, which often starts pretty early in infancy, can develop later in life, but the vast majority of patients do present in their first few years of life. And then after the development of eczema, we might see the development of food allergy, um, commonly to milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tree nut, fish, or shellfish. Those are the most common food allergens that account for the vast majority of food allergies in the U.S. Um, after food allergy development, we often see asthma develop. So we'll see children begin to wheeze or have prolonged coughing or shortness of breath with a common cold or respiratory infections. And then after the development of asthma or at the same time as the development of asthma, um, patients with A to P start to produce allergic antibody to environmental allergens. Um, so we see rhinitis here in this um, slightly orange curve. Uh, that's when we start to see, you know, sneezing, stuffy nose, itchy eyes uh, when exposed to environmental allergens such as dust mite, cat, dog, certain pollens, so grasses, trees, weeds, uh, mold, cockroach, or other animals. The hay fever, the allergic rhinitis component, tends to be pretty persistent throughout life. Um, some people are lucky enough to outgrow eczema um, and food allergies, and some children who develop 
these reactive airways early in life are just transient wheezers and sort of outgrow that asthma. But when there is an allergic component, it, uh, it tends to be more of a persistent um, asthma condition. So now let's take a look at what is going on underneath the surface among patients that have, um, that have eczema. Um, so this is certainly a daunting slide, and by no means am I trying to, uh, to you know, to, to frighten anyone. Um, I must admit, when I was in medical school, you know, we had to memorize all of these different um, chemicals and, you know, cytokines that were responsible for different sorts of inflammation and responses in the body. And, and it really, it looks like alphabet soup below, right? So um, first, let's take a look above. And what we see here is um, bricks and disarray. So what we know about eczema is it's a complex uh, skin disorder that has a wide range of genetic and environmental factors. There are known to be um, several genes which, um, which are affected that um, encode for proteins that hold the skin cells together. So patients that do not have eczema have a really tight skin barrier. Skin cells are held tightly together and there's not significant water loss or moisture loss. What happens is some of these proteins can be defective. Um, one uh, in particular is called filaggrin, um, which, which you may hear about. Um, and basically as a result of these proteins not holding the skin cells together, you get this loose skin barrier. And as a result, you get a lot of moisture loss, a lot of water loss, which leads to this dry, scaly, and then inflamed skin. Since the skin barrier is, is loose, essentially, um, irritants and allergens can then penetrate the skin barrier and increase the inflammation um, that we see in the skin. So not only is this um, you know, something that can be influenced from the outside, there's sort of an internal reason why we have, why we have eczema. Um, it's patients with skewed immune responses. And some of, these, um, some of these below are the ones which are implicated. So you see a ton of cells in the immune system uh, are involved here, many of them overactive. And the reason I wanted to just sort of lay this out here is to, to let you know that not only are these, you know, uh, these numbers and letters sort of alphabet soup, you know, these used to be um, things that we memorized in medical school and there, there wasn't real application for. It. But now is actually a great time to be a patient who has eczema because we have drugs that actually target the cause of inflammation that we see in the skin. So, for example, if you see IL-4 and IL-13 here, sort of in the middle of the slide, these are two chemicals that a drug called dupixent or dupilumab blocks, um, which then leads to um, a reduction in certain chemicals and cells that lead to inflammation and eczema. And there are a lot of other drugs in development that target some of the other chemicals that are depicted here on the screen. So basically this was a way of um, showing what the causes of eczema are, what, um, what factors are at play, and then also to encourage you that, that there already are drugs in development that target the cause of the problem, and many others are, are on the way. So there, there is hope out there for those of you who, um, who are suffering with eczema or have a loved one who have eczema, and I strongly encourage you to, to discuss those with your allergist or dermatologist. Um, so now we're gonna shift over and talk about the food allergy piece. So before we get into specifically food allergy, um, there are a wide range of food reactions that, uh, that you can have. Some are immune mediated, so caused by the immune, you know, reactions by the immune system and others are non-immune mediated. So let's go ahead and kind of lay out some of these immune mediated food reactions. Basically here, we're gonna look at the immune mediated um, food reactions. So the bulk of what we talk about today is gonna to be what we call IgE mediated food allergy, which many of us are familiar with. This typically happens within minutes to an hour of eating food. Um, patients will develop hives, swelling, um, trouble breathing, abdominal pain, blood pressure can drop, and in severe cases, it can, you know, can present as anaphylaxis. Um, there are other conditions known as oral allergy syndrome or pollen food syndrome that many of you out there may actually be experiencing. Um, this basically happens when um, foods you're allergic to look very similar to pollens that you're, that you're allergic to. For example, um, if you're birch tree allergic, if you have really bad springtime allergies, you may develop oral itching with some fruits, veggies, um, soy, or nuts that look a lot like the birch tree pollen, for example, ap uh, apples, peaches, pears, plums, cherries, um, sometimes peanut, almond, hazelnut, or soy. Typically, it's just oral itching and is not a more severe reaction, but in some cases, it can be um, a more significant reaction. And um, then there is uh, another condition, which is, which is rare, but does occur, 
called food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis, where you'll tolerate a food, but if you eat a food allergen and then exercise before or after eating, that exercise kind of acts as a co-trigger, and then you have um, an allergic reaction to that food, which can be severe and present as anaphylaxis. Um, then in the next category, we have these non-IgE mediated or non-allergic antibody mediated um, conditions. One is called FPIs for short. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, FPI stands for food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. And this presents as a delayed uh, gastrointestinal reaction to, to food. So um, one, two, three hours after consuming a food, you will have really severe vomiting, um, uh, diarrhea as well. It can be so significant to the point where such volume is lost that the blood pressure can drop so significantly. In um, infants, this is typically milk, um, soy, grains, um, and these, these babies can look very pale, lethargic, and, and clammy. Um, antihistamines like Benadryl, you know, don't, don't work for these sorts of reactions because the cells that are at play, um, mostly T cells, um, are responsible for this type of reaction. So sometimes IV fluid, steroids, or um, anti-nausea medication can be required for, um, for these types of reactions. Um, FPIs can also occur in adults. Um, when it does, it's, it's most often seafood. Then there's celiac disease, which is not an allergy, but it is an immune-mediated condition. It's basically the immune system responding to gluten and causing symptoms such as bloating, abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, can also have some joint pains, rashes associated with it. Um, and then there's allergic proctocolitis, which typically presents in infancy with mucus, uh, mucusy or bloody stools, but an otherwise happy, you know, healthy baby. Typically, that's due to cow's milk and does get outgrown. Uh, and then there's the sort of mixed uh, mixed conditions, so atopic eczema or eczema, which is worsened by food. Uh, and then there's a condition known as eosinophilic esophagitis. Again, another mouthful, and we call it EOE for short. Um, this is becoming more and more common, and we see this condition among patients who have um, atopic family members or have allergic family members. Uh, this basically is a food-driven uh, condition mostly uh, affects the esophagus, but can affect any part of the uh, gastrointestinal tract. And it can present as abdominal pain, heartburn, um, and then later in its course, food can actually get stuck. You can have sensations of food impaction because over time there's inflammation in the esophagus and the diameter is getting more and more narrow to the point where food you know, cannot pass. Um, this is managed typically by allergists and gastroenterologists. Um, and that basically summarizes the immune-mediated uh, food reactions. Um, over in the non-immune-mediated um, conditions, we have metabolic um, issues such as lactose intolerance or alcohol intolerance, um, pharmacologic or side effects from things like caffeine, you know, causing palpitations. Um, there's toxic um, non-immune-mediated reactions. Uh, one in particular is called scromboid. Basically, this is, um, occurs most often due to thin fish. Um, it looks like, you know, anyone that eats this food is, is having an allergic reaction. So anyone that eats mahi-mahi is a common culprit, basically, and, and in spoiled fish, there are histamine-like uh, chemicals in these fish that can trigger what looks to be a pandemic of allergic reactions among anyone that's consuming this fish. And then um, other um, non-immune mediated reactions um, like food disorders, uh, eating disorders such as anorexia and gustatory rhinitis, which basically um, means runny nose when you eat tends to happen more often in um, the um, older population. And there is a nasal spray that's very effective um, for gustatory rhinitis. Let's move on to the next slide. All right, so now that we took a, a brief overview of food reactions, we're gonna focus in on IgE-mediated food allergy. And as we discussed earlier, IgE is basically uh, the allergic antibody. It's responsible for um, allergic symptoms in the upper airway. You know, those of you that might be allergic to cats or dogs, it's the allergic antibody that recognizes cat and dog allergen and leads to those allergic um, responses. In the lower airway, it can cause asthma-like symptoms when recognizing inhaled allergens. And in the case of food, um, you can develop specific IgE antibodies towards these foods. And then once you consume them, these IgE molecules that are specific to different foods recognize that food and then leads to um, the development of an allergic reaction. Um, so basically with IgE mediated food allergy, every time you eat a specific food within minutes to an hour, 
uh, with a couple exceptions, um, you, you, you know, you have these reproducible symptoms. It can affect any part of the body. Um, so in the respiratory tract, it can cause coughing, wheezing, trouble breathing, shortness of breath. In the GI tract and the gastrointestinal tract, you can um, get abdominal pain, vomiting, or diarrhea. Uh, skin manifestations include hives, swelling, or itching. Um, if the cardiovascular system's uh, involved, you can have a drop in your blood pressure, feel like you're going to faint. Um, in uh, the case of anaphylaxis, many people describe sort of this imp impending sense of doom where they feel like everything is closing in on them. And that typically occurs when your blood pressure is really dropping significantly. Um, orally, you can get oral itching, you can get a throat closing sensation due to swelling in the back of the throat. And as we mentioned, in its most um, severe form, in a life-threatening form of allergic reaction, we call that anaphylaxis. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, and basically here's anaphylaxis at a glance. So anaphylaxis can be due to a wide range of, um, of allergens. Most commonly it's either due to food, um, insect uh, stings or insect venom, um, med various medications can cause this or latex. Um, it's really important to recognize when you're going into anaphylaxis and what that is. There, there are a few definitions for anaphylaxis, but I like to sort of give some rules of thumb. Um, one, if you, if you ever feel like you're having trouble breathing, I would, you know, call that anaphylaxis and administer um, your epinephrine auto-injector, whether that's, you know, the EpiPen, a generic uh, epinephrine, AuvQ, whatever device you, um, you have. The sooner you administer it, the better the outcome will be. And if you do administer it, I would call 911 and get immediate assistance to help you with um, additional um, assistance with your allergic reaction. So we said, if there's ever trouble breathing, I wouldn't think twice that that would meet criteria for, for anaphylaxis. I would use the EpiPen. If you ever feel like you're going to faint, if you feel like this dark cloud coming over you, if you feel this impending sense of doom, I would go ahead and call that anaphylaxis, call that severe allergic reaction and administer your epinephrine. One other definition that we have for anaphylaxis is two or more organ system uh, involvement. And what that means basically is, it, you know, two, two um, organ systems in your body are reacting to, to either the food or medication or whatever that trigger the reaction. So let's say, for example, you're covered in hives, skin, skin's involved, and you're having repeated vomiting, the GI tract is involved. That's a sign that this could progress to something even more severe, and I would not hesitate to use um, epinephrine at, in that case. We recommend that you always carry two epinephrine auto-injectors because some people need a second dose within minutes if they do not respond well enough to the first dose. And it's important that if you do have a reaction, you follow up with your allergist to actually determine, you know, what the cause of your reaction was and to um, plan accordingly, make, make sure that you have an action plan uh, in place for the future. And let's move forward. So IgE-mediated food allergy is becoming more and more common. It affects up to 8% of children. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there are eight common offenders. The vast majority of food allergy is due to one of these eight. So the common eight are milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tree nut, fish, and shellfish. Sesame is sort of number nine. It's also increasing um, in prevalence. And in childhood, we often see milk, egg, wheat, and soy uh, allergy develop. And most of those actually will get outgrown with time. Whereas nut and seafood allergy tend to be pretty persistent. Um, a small percentage uh, of people are lucky enough to outgrow those food allergies, but the vast majority of the time, um, they do stick with you. Uh, the nut and seafood allergies are actually the most common adult onset food allergies as well. So typically, you know, when you hear about an adult developing some new food allergy where they didn't have any before, more often than not, we do hear about development of nut or seafood allergy. And let's move forward. So here um, are the most common culprits um, of food allergens in childhood. Peanut is number one, and that has become increasingly more common over the last several years. Um, that's followed by milk, shellfish, tree nuts, egg, fish, wheat, soy, and sesame. And let's move forward. So let's talk about sensitization versus allergy. And these are terms that can be pretty confusing. Um, not only for patients, but also for us as, as providers. Um, you know, for, for us as allergists, this is something that we really need to wrap our head around so we don't overdiagnose um, patients with asthma and we don't, uh, with, with allergies, and we don't underdiagnose patients with allergies. So 
Um, the term sensitization basically referred to the presence of allergic antibody, the presence of IgE against a specific allergen. This means either you have a positive skin test or a positive blood test to a specific allergen, but the, the positive test alone does not mean that you're allergic to, to, you know, to that food. Um, the term allergy refers to actually having an immune response to a substance that your body has become very sensitive to. So in the sense of food allergy, it means when you eat that food, you are reacting to that food. You are breaking out in hives, you are having trouble breathing, you are having abdominal pain, whatever that reaction might be, it means you are actually reacting to that food. So if you're allergic to an environmental allergen, for example, you get around dogs, they lick you, you may develop hives at the site where they lick you, you may sneeze, you might be itchy around uh, you know, that cat or dog. The problem here with eczema is that this can get very confusing. So patients with eczema make a ton of IgE. They make a lot of allergic antibody. Some of those chemicals that we saw underneath the surface of the skin um, as being very overactive, several of them drive up the production of IgE to where you make IgE. Most people may have it in the you know, double digits. Patients with eczema sometimes have IgE levels in the thousands. Um, so once you have a really high total IgE, when you look for IgE to specific foods, you may get a lot of false positives. And that's where we want to make sure that we're not doing harm with our patients with eczema and overdiagnosing food allergy when you're not truly allergic, rather you're just sensitized. So it's really important, you know, when, when we're practicing allergy that we, we guide everything we do based on the patient's history. So, you know, we take, par we, we take care of patients, we, we take very close, uh, thorough history in terms of what is causing their reactions. And then based on what patients tell us, we decide what to test them to. So we have the ability to test to dozens of foods, but putting a huge panel of food um, on your you know, forearm or back, however we choose to, to test, um, is rarely, rarely indicated. Um, Over-testing happens a lot and leads to a ton of confusion, um, especially for patients with eczema due to these false positive tests. Um, the gold standard to really diagnose food allergy is a food challenge, which means to actually eat the food and See if you have a reaction or not. We use skin testing and blood testing to determine whether that's even safe to do. Um, and we actually have some certain levels for particular foods that tell us whether you're likely allergic. And then we even have some component panels that help tell us whether you might be allergic to high risk or really bad parts of the peanut or tree nut allergen, for example. Um, we can also determine whether you know, young kids who are allergic to milk or egg might be able to tolerate baked milk or egg. And then if they can, that may help them outgrow their milk or egg allergy sooner. So it's basically sensitization versus allergy. Sensitization means you have a positive test. Allergy means you are reacting. Um, and it is something that can be quite confusing, especially for patients with eczema. And let's move forward. So um, here are some images of allergy testing. You see here um, the patient on the top right. Uh, this is the patient who had skin testing. Um, we basically place um, liquid allergens with plastic applicators on the skin, wait about 15, 20 minutes, see um, if you develop a wheel and flare response, if you mount a you know, response to any particular food or environmental allergen. And then this can also be done um, by blood testing. And oftentimes with foods, we'll do both skin and blood testing. Important to know that skin testing has a really high negative predictive value meaning that if the skin testing is negative, it's, it's unlikely you're truly allergic to that food, but the, the positive predictive value is actually pretty poor. So you can get a ton of false positives. So again, uh, the reason um, we should test patients is if they have a history of reaction to a food, or if we're concerned that they've reacted to one food and they put them at risk for another food, but just putting a full panel of, um, of foods on, on patients for no particular reason without a history to support that, you're going to end up getting some false positives, especially among patients with eczema who have very sensitive skin, make a lot of IgE, and you're going to confuse patients and their caregivers, and it can lead to actually nutritional deficiencies. And um, by removing foods from the diet that they may tolerate, you may actually you know, cause patients to develop food allergy. Um, so let's move forward to the next slide. So oral food challenge. Um, this is the most definitive test to diagnose or rule out a food allergy. We use this to tell whether a patient is truly allergic or not. This should only be done um, under the supervision of typically an allergist where anaphylaxis can be recognized and treated accordingly. Basically, we give small increasing amounts of a food allergen and monitor for signs of a reaction. This should only be done after a thorough history is taken. 
and after skin and or blood testing has been performed um, and in order to you know tell us whether the oral food challenge is safe to do and let's move forward so who should be tested for food allergies so basically anyone with a reliable history of an immediate allergic reaction after eating a food should be tested um, children who have severe eczema which is uncontrolled despite optimized maximum you know topical therapy um, can be assessed for a food allergy component uh, the top three offenders are milk egg and peanut so um, up to a third of uh, children with really severe eczema that cannot be controlled topically can have some food allergy contributors. Um, children with severe eczema and or egg allergy are at um, higher risk of peanut allergies. So now the guidelines are to um, test early in life, ideally around the four month mark or so, to see whether early introduction of peanut is appropriate um, or whether that patient has become sensitized to peanut already and needs to continue avoidance. And then if a patient has a history of reaction to a food that increases the likelihood of reacting to another food. So for example, peanut allergy, um, a percentage of patients with peanut allergy may also be allergic to tree nuts. So if they're not already consuming tree nuts, we might wanna go ahead and test those patients who reacted to peanut to tree nuts to see whether it's safe or not to introduce tree nuts. And let's move forward to the next slide. So severe eczema, what is it? Um, it's defined as a persistent or frequently recurring eczema with typical appearance and distribution. It's assessed as severe by a healthcare provider, and it requires frequent need for prescription strength, topical steroids, um, calcineurin inhibitors, which are medications like Protopic or Eladil or Tacrolimus or Pemecrolimus, which are their generic names, um, or other anti-inflammatories like um, PDE4 inhibitors like Bucrisa. Um, and basically, these are patients that cannot get controlled despite very strong topical ointments. These are patients that, you know, that suffer often, you know, are up all night scratching. These are patients that we know when we see them, they walk into our office, um, you know, every day, their quality of life's impaired. Um, and their parents are struggling too, you know, it affects sleep, it affects productivity at work. And um, luckily there are solutions for these patients and let's move forward. So food exacerbated eczema, um, this basically describes um, where eczema is flared due to ingesting a specific food. This can occur within minutes, it can occur within a few hours, and it can be delayed um, if there's chronic ingestion of the, um, of the culprit. This can be due to IgE, it can be due to the allergic antibody, or it can be due to other uh, parts of the immune system. And testing may or not be helpful for, um, for determining what's the causative agent, um, and again, Patients can have persistent lesions if the food is eaten chronically. And let's move forward to the next one. Elimination diet. So um, we talked about the overuse of allergy testing, especially for patients with eczema. It's really important that extensive elimination diets based only on skin tests or positive blood tests, these really should not be done um, because we can lead to nutritional deficiency by removing um, foods from the diet at least unnecessary anxiety and actually removing food allergens that are tolerated um, from the diet of patients with eczema can lead to the development of food allergy um, and, and you know they can become very severe potentially anaphylactic um, type food allergies when that occurs um, skin testing can be useful for the uh, patients with severe eczema who cannot be controlled um, again we should focus on the top three milk egg and peanut first um, I would, if an elimination diet is performed, I would recommend three to four weeks. That should lead to a significant improvement if it is food driven. And um, if it is not improving after three, four weeks, I would go ahead and put that food back into the diet to prevent the development of food allergy uh, to that food. Uh, and if, if an improvement is not seen in that three, four weeks, it's highly unlikely that that food was driving any of the inflammation um, in, uh, in the skin. And then eliminating the food from the diet, as we mentioned, can increase the chances of developing IgE-mediated food allergy. And it shows how you know, eliminating multiple foods on the basis of testing alone can actually do harm and create unnecessary anxiety. Let's move forward. Uh, the prevention of food allergies. So let's talk about things that we can do to prevent the development of food allergy. We talked earlier about the atopic march. We talked about eczema being often the first presenting uh, condition in the atopic march, and food allergy is very often number two. 
So um, about 20 years ago, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended waiting until three years of age before introducing peanuts. Um, it actually recommended waiting um, to introduce uh, food allergens. And what we've learned over the last 20 plus years is that that actually did harm. By delaying uh, introduction of food allergens, we actually ended up increasing the, uh, the prevalence of food allergy. Um, so in 2015, there was um, a LEAP study the Learning Early About Peanut Allergy Study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which basically showed that uh, early consumption of peanut was actually protective against the development of food allergy. And in 2017, new guidelines were introduced encouraging early introduction of peanuts as well as other um, food allergens, especially among those children who are at high risk. So we talked about egg allergic patients, patients with severe eczema. We really want to try to get peanut in the diet early if it's safe. Um, guided by allergy testing. And let's move forward. So let's talk about the um, early introduction of peanuts, um, which was a study in 2008. This was a study that looked at the prevalence of peanut allergy among Israeli and um, uh, Jewish children in the UK and looked at the relationship of peanut allergy to infant peanut consumption. So they looked at very similar cohorts. They looked at Jewish children in the UK, Jewish children in Israel, and looked at the prevalence of peanut allergy. And what, what, what they found was actually quite astonishing. The uh, prevalence of peanut allergy in the UK was 1.85%, whereas the prevalence of peanut allergy in Israel was 0.17%. So quite striking that Jewish children in the UK had a prevalence of peanut allergy that was 10 times higher than that of Jewish children in Israel. And why was the question which was posed. And peanut is actually introduced very early in life in Israel. It's a snack called bamba, which is basically a, a peanut flavored Cheeto uh, that you can find basically anywhere now. Um, and we found that th the fact that these children were eating this peanut snack early in life actually led to a lower incidence of peanut allergy. So then this, uh, this study raised the question of whether early introduction of peanut during infancy will prevent the development of peanut allergy later in life. And let's move to the next slide. So then there's the LEAP trial. This is uh, LEAP stands for Learning Early About Peanut Allergy. This was a study that took 640 infants uh, between uh, four and 11 months of age with severe eczema, egg allergy, or both. So basically at-risk children, um, high-risk children for the development of food allergy. Skin testing was performed to peanut at the beginning. And then infants were randomized into two groups. So one had regularly, uh, regularly consumed peanuts starting in infancy, and the other group completely avoided peanut altogether. And then at the end of five years, at five years of age, then they looked at the uh, incidence of peanut allergy in between both groups. And let's move forward to see what the study showed. So basically what you see here is really impressive, uh, really impressive data. So if you look over here, the prevalence of allergy in the group that regularly consumed peanut was less than 2%, whereas the group that completely avoided peanut, almost 14% of those patients actually developed peanut allergy. Um, and then in the middle here, you see these are the patients that actually tested positive for peanut. Those that avoided it, over 35% developed peanut allergy, whereas those that consumed it, 10.6% of those um, patients developed peanut allergy. Um, and in both cohorts, you can see the, um, the overall rates um, in the avoidance group, over 17% versus 3% in the consumption group, clearly showing that early introduction of peanuts, regular consumption of peanuts early in life does in fact, prevent the development of peanut allergy. And let's move towards the next slide. Um, so basically here are the, uh, the guidelines. So patients who are high risk, and high risk um, refers to those with severe eczema, egg allergy, or both. Um, around four to six months of age, those patients should undergo either skin testing and or blood testing by an allergist. And then if appropriate, consider um, a challenge to peanut in the, uh, in the office, as long as the, the tests are reassuring. Um, those patients with mild to moderate eczema, it's recommended that at six months of age, um, introduction is performed. This could be done at home if parents feel comfortable enough. I offer the option to do peanut challenges in, uh, in the office um, if it does relieve some of the uh, anxiety towards parents. And then those patients who have no eczema and no food allergy, we still recommend early introduction. We certainly do not recommend waiting until three years anymore. Um, so whenever it is age appropriate uh, for those patients to go ahead and consume peanut, we recommend that they do so. But again, the, um, the sooner the better, the earlier the better, really. And next slide. 
uh, back one. So here, yeah, here basically is um, uh, a diagram depicting the blood testing over here on the left, um, which can be done. You can look for specific um, allergic antibody to peanut. Um, if it's negative, often um, you can go ahead and do that at home versus a supervised feeding in the office. Um, if it's positive, certainly a patient needs to be evaluated by an allergist. And then we also look at the size of the skin prick wheel to actually determine whether um, it's safe enough to try to um, feed um, the patient peanut or if it strictly needs to be avoided. The larger the wheel, the more likely um, that patient is to be truly allergic. And let's move forward to talk about uh, actually a treatment for peanut allergy. Um, so there is one FDA product, which is uh, FDA approved product, which is currently uh, available to children four to 17 years of age with peanut allergy. Um, for many years, we've been doing, as allergists, we've been doing allergy shots, immunotherapy, where we basically give increasing amounts of the environmental allergens to which patients are allergic um, and basically shift the way their immune system responds to those environmental allergies, make them more tolerant of their pets, make them less miserable during spring, summer, um, fall seasons, you know, make them less allergic to their pollens. So, so we can actually do that with peanut allergen. So basically, um, the product is called Palforzia. Uh, it is a form of oral immunotherapy, which is a treatment where um, food allergic patients consume gradually increasing amounts of the food to which they're allergic to basically increase their threshold for allergic reaction. Um, and the, the point of this product um, or this drug, if you want to call it, is basically to reduce the risk of a severe allergic reaction due to cross-contamination or accidental ingestion. Um, really important to note that patients still need to continue peanut avoidance. This treatment is not a cure. There is a significant risk of allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis. Um, for this reason, it's done under the supervision um, of an allergist. Essentially, every two weeks, um, you go into the allergist office, you get an up dose. Um, you basically double the dose of the, um, of the peanut allergen. It's basically peanut flour in a capsule. It can be um, put into applesauce or some other uh, type of food that you might like to eat. And then you consume that dose every day at home for two weeks. You come back in, you double the dose make sure it's tolerated. You do that for about six months, as long as there are no hiccups or react, bad reactions along the way. And then at the end of the six month period, you typically tolerate one to two um, peanuts worth of peanut allergens. So if you accidentally go out to a restaurant, eat someone's sandwich by accident that has peanuts in it, or you know, some cross contamination at school, um, you, you will not have a reaction or you'll have a more mild reaction, but you still have to um, continue avoidance. But certainly a great option for patients who are very interested in becoming less allergic and does relieve some anxiety, although there is up to 10% anaphylaxis risk um, during the buildup phase with, with palforzia. And let's move forward. Now we're going to shift gears into the environmental allergen. So many of you out there um, suffering with eczema likely also have some environmental allergies, right? Many patients with eczema go on and, and toward, toward this uh, atopic march, this allergic march, become allergic to all sorts of allergens that they inhale 365 days a year. So um, uh, environmental allergens can be perennial, which means year round. Uh, and those include house dust mite, dog, cat, mold, cockroach, rodents, and plenty of other animals. Um, seasonal uh, allergens include pollens, so trees which pollinate in the spring, grasses which pollinate in the summer, and weeds which pollinate in the fall. And many of us know these very unpleasant symptoms. You can see the picture here of um, this girl who has a Kleenex, um, basically, you know, glued to her face, uh, showing here it's in her problematic pollen season, itchy eyes, watery eyes, stuffy nose, sneezing, post-nasal drip, scratchy throat, itchy ears, and, and really can cause a lot of fatigue and, um, and discomfort to these patients who struggle with environmental allergies. And let's move forward. So let's first talk about dust mites. And here is a lovely image of these microscopic creatures that you cannot see. Uh, they basically settle in all house dust. They are of the Dermatophagoidae species. Um, Derferinae and Derterinicinus are the two most common species. We often refer to them as, as DF and DP. Um, so if you've gotten an aller allergy test before and you see, um, you know, DF or DP are likely referring to these dust mites. Um, they're very, very common allergens. They're very potent allergens. Um, lovely that their allergens are actually contained in their fecal particles. 
Um, and it is commonly found in house dust, bedding, and sheets. Exposure to these dust mites can trigger or worsen um, hay fever or rhinitis symptoms, upper airway symptoms, asthma, um, conjunctivitis, and can increase the uh, inflammation in the skin among patients who suffer from eczema. Uh, important to note that other than triggering really unpleasant allergic symptoms, they don't pose major harm uh, to humans otherwise. And let's move forward. So what can we do, um, what environmental precautions can we take to, to decrease the dust mite burden? Um, one, one thing we can do is use a vacuum with a HEPA filtration uh, system weekly to minimize carpeting, upholstered furniture and drapes. Using a HEPA air purifier may be helpful. Dust mite covers for the bedding, washing the sheets, pillowcases, mattress pads and blankets in really hot water uh, once a week, reducing the number of stuffed animals in the room, using a, de uh, a dehumidifier, uh, since these uh, little creatures love humidity and thrive in humidity, uh, reducing the relative humidity less than 50% is helpful. Um, use of insecticides such as tannic acid and benzyl benzoate may be short-lived and modest at best. Uh, important to note that several months of sustained intervention measures are really needed to show clinical benefit. So really, really, um, these are precautions that you need to continue taking if you are sensitized to dust mites. And let's move forward. So pets, um, and on the slide is my favorite pet, my, uh, my mini dachshund here, um, who I can't help but dress up in um, hot dog costumes because it's fitting. And um, the most common pet allergens out there are cats and dogs, but other household pets definitely need to be considered. Um, these allergen particles are really small and it keeps the allergen airborne for a very long period of time. You can find the allergens in dander, saliva, urine as well. Um, the allergen can be transferred on clothes can be found in schools and homes uh, where there aren't even pets. Um, and the cat specifically is an incredibly sticky allergen. So even if cat is removed from a home, it takes months for uh, that home to get back to baseline level of, uh, you know, of a lack of cat allergen. Um, unfortunately, pets that are marketed as hypoallergenic still do contain allergens. No clear evidence that one particular breed is less allergenic, but certainly, you know, the smaller, um, less uh, less likely to shed dogs will likely be less problematic. Um, most people do react to common allergens, but animals have several different allergens that patients can be sensitized to. And let's move forward to talk about some precautions that can be taken in regards to decreasing pet dander. So um, HEPA air filtration units uh, have been shown to be helpful for um, reducing um, pet dander, regularly vacuuming with a HEPA filter, um, washing pets once to twice a week, although not always that easy, um, is certainly helpful. Occasionally, pet removal may be necessary, especially in the case of um, a severe asthmatic who really is, you know, having asthma attacks due to the pet at home. I am not a fan of making enemies with, uh, with my patients, um, and it's rare that we actually need to do this, but, you know, there are circumstances where that's required. And important to note that allergen um, does persist for months even after removing a pet. And we see a very lovable little guy here next to the uh, HEPA air filter, which would probably be worth considering if you have um, a pet at home. And let's move forward. Um, pollen. So this is something that many of us are very familiar with. Um, spring season can be very problematic for patients who are allergic to trees. Um, summer can be very unpleasant for patients allergic to grass. Um, fall can be incredibly unpleasant for those allergic to weeds. And in the winter, if any of you um, are based in Texas, there's something called cedar fever, where uh, some of the trees actually pollinate in the winter as well. And let's move forward to talk about some precautions we can take in regards to pollen. Um, keeping windows closed, avoid line drying, showering after exposure before bed, so you're not bringing the pollen into bed with you, um, using sinus fringes, natural tears, just as sort of barriers. Um, are basically the most, uh, the most important pollen avoidance measures. And let's move forward. We're almost to the end, and I really thank you all for your patience. Um, we're gonna talk about testing for environmental allergies, which basically can be done the exact same way as testing for food allergies, can be done by skin testing um, and or blood testing. Many labs do have regional panels where you can look for the most common allergens in your particular area. And let's move forward. Treatment for environmental allergies. So treatment options include medications um, and or immunotherapy. 
Um, typical medications that are used include nasal steroids like nasacort, Flonase, Rhinocort, things like that. Um, nasal antihistamines such as azelastin or patinase, um, oral antihistamines, Claritin, Benadryl, Allegra, Zyrtec, Zizol, Benadryl, many of them out there, and then antihistamine eye drops. Those are the most commonly used medications for um, environmental allergies for hay fever uh, symptoms. And then there's immunotherapy, which basically shifts the way your immune system responds to specific allergens, making you less allergic to your triggers. Most commonly, this is done with allergy shots. Um, allergy shots are given as a three to five year treatment course, um, basically small increasing amount of that allergen is, is given typically weekly until you reach the top dose, at which point you get to your monthly maintenance dose. There are some FDA approved so, um, sublingual tablets that you take at home once a day for three to five years. And these are currently FDA approved for dust mites, ragweed, and grass pollen. And I really strongly encourage you all to discuss treatment options with your allergist, not only for your environmental allergies, but any other allergic condition that may come along with this atopic, this allergic, uh, March that presents in the form of eczema, food allergy, environmental allergies, um, asthma, and, and you can have, you know, one of these, or you can have, you can have all of them. But you know, basically, these are conditions that we, you know, we take care of day in and day out. Um, treatment options have really, really come a long way. Uh, we have therapies that really target sources of inflammation, incredibly high up for severe diseases um, such as nasal polyps, um, eczema asthma, chronic hives, um, and we really have, you know, great tools to improve quality of life. So I'd like to go ahead and empower you all to, to please take control of your skin, take, take, take control over eczema. It should not control you or your life in any way. Uh, the options are out there, the tools are out there, and I strongly encourage you to find a doctor who is willing to turn your life around because eczema should not control your life. And let's move forward to the next one. And that's it, actually. So um, thank you again. I want to thank the National Eczema Association for, uh, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure. I really am very passionate about caring for patients with eczema. And I encourage you guys to, to educate yourself more about the treatments that are out there and those that are in the pipelines. And at this time, I'll be happy to take questions. Great. Thanks so much for the presentation. We have a handful of questions to get through here. All right. So first one. Is there a link between eczema and exercise urticardia? So that's a great question. So um, exercise induced urticaria. Urticaria is basically the medical term for hives. Um, we separate hives into two categories, uh, acute and chronic. Um, chronic, we consider hives to be chronic when they're going on beyond six weeks. Uh, on average, it lasts two to five years. Sometimes it burns itself out before then. Sometimes it lasts for many, many years. Um, basically, urticaria is a mast cell driven issue. We all have these cells in our body called mast cells, which are allergic type cells, carry chemicals in them like uh, histamine, prostaglandin, leukotrienes, all sorts of chemicals that increase inflammation. There are a lot of physical triggers that people with um, chronic hives can have. And you mentioned exercise. So um, certainly exercise, increased body temperature, uh, showers can cause hives. Some people have what we call dermatographism, which means writing on the skin. So scratching the skin can actually produce these wheels. You can write the alphabet on your skin. Um, cold sometimes can trigger it. Water exposure can trigger it. And then, then there's, most patients have these idiopathic or unknown causes of hives. Um, so patients that have eczema may also develop hives as well. Um, you know, it's another part of the immune system, this Th2 skewed immune system that can be overactive. But having eczema by itself doesn't necessarily mean you're going to develop hives. Um, but there is a certainly, you know, treatment options for those patients suffering with chronic hives, especially exercise induced um, urticaria. Typically, uh, antihistamines are used first, and sometimes we need to go up to really high doses of antihistamines. So up to three, four times a regular dose of, say, an Allegra Zyrtec Claritin. Um, Similar to Dupixin, as we talked about for, you know, sort of being the sledgehammer for, um, for eczema, really targeting the source of the inflammation. Zolair is the uh, monthly injection for patients with chronic hives that um, is used to control patients who do not respond to high-dose allergy medication. So I basically view Zolair as, as, as the Dupixin for hives, right? It's the, it's the drug which targets the source of the problem, it targets IgE and, and blocks the overactive part of the immune system, which causes um, chronic hives. I hope that hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. 
Next one, can allergic reactions to ingested food be delayed? Especially wondering about this in this case of scromboid. Um, good question. So scromboid tends, tends to occur pretty rapidly. Um, there are some delayed allergic reactions. One that's pretty rare, um, but I actually see a decent amount of here in, in Tennessee and Mississippi is an allergy called alpha-gal allergy. Um, and basically what happens in alpha-gal is you get bitten by a tick, um, the saliva cross-reacts with uh, mammalian meat, so beef, pork, lamb, and then hours after you eat beef, pork, or lamb, you end up developing hives, swelling, you can have, even have anaphylaxis. Um, so that is one instance of, of a delayed allergic reaction, and, and it presents just like food allergy, but just many hours, you know, hours later, whereas typically it's within minutes to an hour. Um, we briefly mentioned this, the FPIs, um, the food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome um, earlier, and that's sort of a delayed GI reaction to foods that's all GI in nature. So it's vomiting, it's diarrhea, blood pressure can really drop, infants can look really pale, clammy, um, and lethargic. So those are, those are probably the more common delayed uh, reactions. Then there's sort of the food-driven eczema. So, you know, if food is being eaten chronically for a, severe, a patient with severe eczema, um, a food can be contributing to that in sort of a chronic uh, basis. Those are probably the most common ones. Um, and then we talked about the eosinophilic esophagitis or EOE, and that's, that's a chronic um, condition where you get heartburn, abdominal pain, um, food can actually feel like it's getting stuck. Um, that's another condition that occurs among allergic or atopic patients. All right, next question. How accurate are patch tests? Are patch tests for foods more or less accurate than patch tests for environmental allergens? So patch tests for foods are not incredibly helpful. Um, there are a lot of false positives. There, there are not many reasons why you would actually do a patch test to, um, to food, to be honest. The only reason one might really consider patch testing to a food would be for eosinophilic esophagitis, for the EOE. Um, but studies have actually shown that eliminating the most common foods that cause um, eosinophilic esophagitis or EOE is a lot more likely to, to result in a better outcome than using skin prick testing or patch testing to a food. So I'm not a huge fan of patch tested foods. Um, and EOE would be the one circumstance where I might consider it. Um, in regards to patch testing for contact allergens, so a lot of patients with eczema are sensitized to allergens that are out there in everyday products, so shampoos, soaps, detergents, and patch testing can be done to help determine um, if there is a contact dermatitis that's coexisting and worsening the eczema. Um, and those can be very helpful and, and can be very reliable, but it's really important to take the, the result, uh, whether it's a patch test or a skin test for food, and put it together with a history. So if you are having really bad uh, scalp and eyelid, uh, eyelid um, rashes, and you're using a non-hypoallergenic uh, shampoo, for example, you do a patch test, and you find you have a really impressive reaction to one of the allergens in your shampoo, that, that is clinically significant. And that makes sense because your scalp and your eyelids are involved, so that shampoo is dripping down, likely causing all the problems. You can get some false positives or clinically insignificant positives on patch tests. So if you're allergic to something which is not found in any of your products whatsoever, there's not much you need to do about that positive test other than look out for that allergen in the future. So again, everything comes down to history-driven testing, and then that test result needs to be interpreted in the context of the clinical history. And same with foods. You, last thing you want to do is put a panel of foods on and start eliminating foods that you tolerate regularly because causes a lot of confusion. Here's a question from our chat here. Since early introduction to peanut is recommended for infants with high risk of eczema, how about early intro to tree nuts as well? Um, early introduction to tree nuts is also a, a great idea. I, I really try to get all major food allergens into the diet um, as soon as it's appropriate to consume that food. Um, so I'll use Nutella, almond milk as you know, some of the early uh, introduced foods. Um, basically, some studies have looked at that and, and shown that earlier the better across the board, not just for peanut, but um, for egg, for peanut. Um, I try and get fish and shellfish in early as well. I just, uh, the hygiene hypothesis is one, one thing that you may have heard of that 
we think that we've kind of lived in a sterile bubble and we don't introduce allergens early enough uh, in life. And so um, what the early introduction of peanut or other food allergens is really trying to do is, is give the immune system that exposure early on so it doesn't you know, view these allergens as foreign when it's, when it's seeing them years later. Next one here, can Steven Johnson syndrome caused by an antibiotic trigger eczema that has been dormant for years? Uh, that's a great question. I don't think I've personally seen that. Um, anything, you know, in terms of skin conditions, whether we're talking about eczema or hives, I mean, anything that, that revs up the immune system and puts it on heightened alert can lead to more inflammation. Um, so I would imagine that having a really bad Steven Johnson syndrome, which, which causes, you know, a really severe sloughing, peeling rash, which, which can actually be life-threatening, um, you know, certainly could increase inflammation in the skin. Well, I ha haven't seen it personally where that causes eczema because I haven't seen Steven Johnson that much in person, thank God. Um, but I could see that as being a possibility. And I think we have two more questions here. So is there an easy way to do an elimination diet only cutting out one food or one food group at a time? Sure, and I would recommend one at a time. Um, you know, I would, I would, if we're talking about eczema and food-driven eczema, again, I would, I would make sure that you've optimized all the, the topical therapies um, and you're still failing that. Um, there's about a third of kids with really severe eczema that, that we can't control, you know, with topicals. Can have food allergies. Again, I would focus on the top three, so milk, egg, peanut. I would use skin testing to try to determine, um, and history to determine, you know, which, if any, should be removed first. Uh, remove one at a time, give it three to four weeks, and if there's no improvement, put it, you know, put it right back in the diet so you don't um, develop reactions. I've certainly had patients who have eliminated foods like milk and wheat, and even as an adult, um, have actually developed anaphylactic reactions to those foods, and th those are difficult foods um, to avoid, especially if you like pizza. So um, you don't want to avoid a uh, food for a prolonged period of time if it's not making a difference in your skin. Thank you. Okay, last question here. If my blood and patch tests are all negative for allergies, but I still have environmental allergy symptoms, is it possible to still have the allergy or would it be considered a sensitivity in that case? And if it's not an actual allergy, would I still need to be concerned about the atopic march? So I imagine we're talking here about uh, like environmental allergies, stuffy, sneezy, itchy sort of symptoms, is that correct? I believe so. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like it. So um, there is a condition called uh, local allergic rhinitis, uh, where basically you look and sound like an allergic patient. You have the typical, you know, symptoms. You're around a dog and you have symptoms, or you're, you know, you really flare and spring, and it sure sounds like you're tree allergic, but the testing's negative. Um, it's certainly possible to produce allergic responses in in the nose and the upper airways and have those typical symptoms. If you don't test positive to, to the allergens, we can't technically offer allergy shots. Um, you back in the day, or maybe some people actually do it in academic settings, but you can actually take, take uh, some nasal secretions and look for eosinophils, look for these allergic white blood cells in the mucus to see if you're actually mounting allergic responses. Um, not quite sure how that would change management that much, but it's a nice academic thing to do. Um, one other option would be to actually perform nasal challenges. So have you inhale um, the allergens to which we think you're sensitized. And if you actually react on nasal challenge, then you could be a, a candidate for allergy shots. Um, basically patients who have this local allergic rhinitis or non-allergic rhinitis, uh, treat them really similarly to patients who light up the board on allergy testing. So nasal steroids, nasal antihistamines, oral antihistamines, antihistamine eye drops. And typically those patients, you know, patients still respond really, really well to medications. It's just a matter of whether or not we can identify those allergens and whether or not we can treat them with immunotherapy. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Zellig. Thanks for your presentation and thanks for getting us a better understanding of eczema and allergies. And thanks to you all for attending us, attending our webinar today. You can continue your eczema education on our website at nationaleczema.org. You may register for one of our upcoming webinars or watch the recording of a previous webinar at nationaleczema.org slash webinar dash Wednesdays. Once again, I'm Danny Morshead on behalf of the National Eczema Association. Thanks so much for joining us.